It's uh, to be found on page 857 in the Pew Bibles or uh, 1069 in the uh, larger print versions. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is God's holy and errant and inspired word. May he write its eternal truths on each one of our hearts this morning. You can see from the sermon outline, you want to approach uh, this, really this one verse in, in three different ways, uh, looking at uh, glory, uh, peace, and then finally what it means when uh, Luke and this angel uh, say uh, that uh, there is peace among those with whom God is pleased. What does it mean to please uh, God? And you'll see it, it, it all uh, does, I think, hopefully come together here. Uh, first of all, uh, glory. What is it? It's sometimes the simplest words. It's sometimes the words that we use uh, the most that uh, if we are pressed are sometimes the most difficult to define. So we ask, what is glory? And uh, I think maybe you'll start to see. Specifically, it's maybe not as easy as you might think to define what glory is. Historically, uh, a lot of uh, uh, Christian uh, writers and teachers have talked about glory as weightiness. Uh, if something is heavy or bears weight, uh, uh, maybe the more modern term would be uh, gravitas, that there's uh, something there that goes beyond just surface level uh, things. And I think that's a, an excellent way to, to look at it. Uh, but I think uh, as we even dig into that, that idea of glory, and especially glory to God in the highest, we can maybe even do a little bit better than that and add uh, to that. Uh, there's uh, a philosopher who used to be at the University of Notre Dame, I think he's uh, now retired by the name of Alistair McIntyre. And Alistair McIntyre uh, argues on a very high level, he's, he's a, a theist, certainly, uh, that in order to uh, understand glory and something's glory, you have to, first of all, understand what that thing has been created to be or to do. For uh, example, I have a, a, an iPad here uh, before me, and you might say, uh, is that a good iPad or a bad uh, iPad? And uh, in, on the more sort of silly side, you might say, well, you know, I, I tried to uh, you know, redo the boards in my deck and uh, hammered in some nails with my iPad and, and I really didn't do a very good job. It's, it's a bad iPad, right? I mean, nobody hopefully would ever do something such as that, but, but I, I think you see the point. To determine something's glory, you first have to determine, you have to know what that thing is created to do. Uh, I'm not really sure, to be honest, what iPads are really fully capable of. They uh, keep my sermon notes uh, here for me quite well. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, but they certainly were not created 
to nail nails in, right? That's a, a hammer's job, and, and you start to see the point. Once you establish something's purpose, only then can you begin to determine its glory and understand and know and see what that thing's weight, its glory is. In our uh, standards of faith and what we believe, we have the Westminster Shorter Catechism question one asks, what is man's chief end? That is, you see, what is man created for? And the answer I hope we all know is that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's what human beings were created for and to do. And we start to see then what glory looks like and that there are degrees of glory. The more we glorify God, the more we look to Him, the more we acknowledge Him and live for Him and worship Him. Only then do we start to see the glory of human beings excelling more and more. But it's hard to define that. I think there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, we live in a day and an age where there are many imitators out there. There are many things claiming to be God, seeking and promising greatness, promising glory to us. Our hearts are sort of drawn to those things. They promise greatness. They promise glory. But as you know as well as I do, they never deliver. When it comes to God's glory, there's one commentator I think as well put it, uh, he says, glory isn't a part of God, it's all that God is. Every aspect of who God is and every part of what God does is glorious. But you see, even that isn't enough to describe and to understand God's glory. Not only is He glorious in every way, but even the very glory of God is glorious. And you start to see how great He is. For instance, Isaiah 40, 12 says uh, of God, uh, He is him who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. And it's not just talking about waters as great and glorious as that might be that, that fell last night that are kind of falling right now outside. It's talking about all the water in the universe. I mean, think of it. I mean, how much water can you hold in your hand? Not very much, I would imagine. And the scriptures say that God holds all the waters in the palm of his hand. The glory is immense. It's infinite. It's eternal. It's unchanging, this glory of God. And so it, from that angle, it becomes even more difficult and challenging at times to define and to understand. Third reason why I think it's such a, a challenge to define glory is that each one of us, by nature, by birth, tends to be and is a glory thief. We steal God's glory all the time. We take credit for that which is not ours. We ascribe it to other things. And it all rightly belongs to God. If we are to be living our lives for the glory of God and uh, acknowledging and understanding that this is our chief purpose, this is our main end in life, then each of us has a big problem. Because we want to keep that, we want to maintain that. We want to claim that for our own. So that's why the angel, when he's uh, appearing here, 
at the glorious uh, birth uh, of Jesus can say and proclaim to all the earth that glory belongs to God in the highest. <coughs> of course, we see that so clearly in what he has done, even in this act of incarnation, of, of God taking on human flesh. The glory is uh, given, if you will, to the earth. Our salvation has now uh, come in human form. And as this little baby grows and develops and gets bigger and bigger, we're going to see this glory increasing. Finally, in the resurrection, not his most glorious moment, after giving his life, Jesus Christ, on the cross, remaining in the grave for three days, he rises again from the dead. Glory to God in the highest, that's the first thing. The second thing we see that this announcement brings with it, that this Savior brings with him, is peace. And on earth, peace among those with whom God is well pleased. A new man years ago who uh, had, had really done very, very well, I think, on uh, Wall Street and worked in in Manhattan for most of his life and, and uh, was involved with a, a lot of banks in the latter part of his career in, in bringing investment to African countries, African nations. And one of the things I remember him saying uh, was that uh, when they start looking for these investment opportunities, the first thing they look for is peace and stability in that country's government. They said peace is the forerunner of prosperity. Now, this is not a prosperity gospel message today. Hopefully it will never be that. Uh, this is not a biblical uh, concept. But there is this notion of peace that I think we need very desperately in our world today to grab hold of and to understand a little bit better. Because if there is no peace, then we are not going to bear fruit. We are not going to please God in our lives and in our actions. And if you look around at the world today, if you understand anything of it, even uh, uh, the staunchest uh, critics on both sides of the aisle, uh, nobody is denying that today we live in an extremely anxious age. In fact, anxiety today is at unprecedented levels that, that many say have never before been seen in society. They're typified among this sort of up-and-coming generation known as Gen Z. And if you look at Gen Z, for instance, some of the things, some of the marks, some of uh, the things that stand out are, are things like suicide rates, are, are through the roof. But there's just this unprecedented level of worry and anxiety. Another philosopher by the name of Charles Taylor uh, talks about this secular age and describes it in terms of, of what he calls mutual display. And on the one hand, what mutual display is, and this is mostly sort of uh, geared towards uh, Gen Z, we're going to see it doesn't just end there, but on the one hand, each of us, Taylor would say, is fighting to be seen. We're sort of broadcasting these identities out into the world that we have created that we see as important. And then based on how much you are seen and how much people pick up and acknowledge these identities, these perceptions, determines a person's worth, a person's identity, and who you are going to be. I mean, and, and you see, it's, it's not just 
Gen Z that does it? And of you, any of you that have been or are on social media know a little something about this? Even the older generations are known as the baby boomers, right? They will say things uh, uh, such as, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just putting my family photos from this big Thanksgiving get-together up there uh, uh, because, you know, friends and family that live far away can see them, right? And that's all fine and dandy and good. There's probably some measure of truth to that as well. But at the same time, come on, you know, really? <laughs> There's something else that you're looking for there. There's a, an identity that you're broadcasting out into the interwebs that you want to be seen. Oh, look at him. Such a good family man. Oh, look at her. Look at, look at them. You know, they're doing so well. Successful, tanned, and, uh, and you get the idea. I think the baby boomers are better at dealing with it. They don't get the, the levels of anxiety that the newer generations are getting. But at the same time, it's still there to certain degrees. As I look out into the world today and, and try to understand it a little bit better, I'm like all of you getting older and becoming less and less relevant. Uh, I don't think I've been relevant for 20 years now anyway, but that's beside the point. It's another issue entirely. Uh, I, I still uh, try to understand uh, a little bit as best I can. And I don't even know if anybody listens to this band anymore. Uh, there's a band uh, we used to listen to years ago by the name of Arcade Fire. And they released uh, an album in, in 2017, so it's not even that new, that relevant. Um, but it was a very interesting album. And I, I realized that like even the younger kids here today, like bands don't even make albums, I don't think, anymore, right? It used to be that you would listen to all 12 or 13 tracks on an album. Now we just pick them off iTunes, whichever ones we want, it doesn't really... But, but they used to weave together sort of this tapestry. Anyway, uh, Arcade uh, Fire have a song on this album. It's, it's actually a somewhat spiritual album. But the, the name of the song is, is called Creature Comforts. Here's what they say, just a very small snapshot that I think says a lot about our modern age. It says, some boys hate themselves, spend their lives resenting their fathers. Some girls hate their bodies, stand in the mirror and wait for the feedback, saying, God, make me famous. If you can't, just make it painless. And I think that, 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 that typifies well this attitude of mutual display, looking to the world, looking to whomever will give them the attention to justify, to verify, to make it real for them. And if they don't receive that, just make it painless. It's tragic, really. It's, it's incredibly sad. That this is why we see a lot of teenage suicide today. It's at least getting to the heart of that. And so I, I'm trying to make the point here that this anxiety that exists, this angst that is there in the hearts of so many young people today, that anxiety is actually the opposite of joy. And that it comes because there is no peace in so many people's hearts today. That anxiety is the opposite of joy and, and, and like that investment banker. That in order to have joy and to reap the fruits of joy, you have to first have peace. And notice what the angel's announcement says, peace on earth. That peace is entirely possible. 
and only possible through this baby boy that was born in Jerusalem. What kind of peace, you might ask? Well, first and foremost, that there is spiritual peace. That this baby Jesus, this Jesus Christ, this, this God-man has come to give us peace that we no longer have to look to the world, look to social media, look to our friends and society and whatever else it is, whatever these idols are that we're creating to validate ourselves and our own personal identities. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to perform to earn your salvation. This is exactly what this means. That God has come. He has done the heavy lifting. All of it. His son is born in human flesh. So that he might do the work for you. So, if we see that the, the Gen Z generation is, is fretting and anxious, how, how about the church? And sadly, when we look at the church, there's all kinds of anxiety there as well. Sometimes talking to church people kind of feel like it's like, turning on some of the talking heads on the news, the conservative news, anyway. <clears throat> that uh, there's all kinds of anxiety. The world's falling apart, the sky's falling in. How are we gonna feed our kids? I mean, I'm not trying to make fun or make light. I mean, fears and anxieties are real. But I read a book years ago by by a man named David Wells that used to be out, I think, on our, our bookshelves out there. Um, it's called God in the Wasteland. And what Wells does is he kind of, I think, does a, a very fair and, and realistic critique of the evangelical church today, of which we're part of. This is one of his uh, takeaways here from God in the Wasteland. It was, it was written... 20 years ago, I think it still rings true today, it says the fundamental problem in the evangelical world today is not inadequate technique, insufficient organization, or antiquated music. And those who want to squander the church's resources bandaging these scratches will do nothing to staunch the flow of blood that is spilling from its true wounds. The fundamental problem in the evangelical world today is that God rests too inconsequentially upon the church. His truth is too distant. His grace is too ordinary. His judgment is too benign. And his gospel is too easy. And his Christ is too common. Now, I don't know about you, but I think he's exactly right. That God rests too inconsequentially upon the church today. That we've been somehow distracted by lights and smoke machines and uh, irrelevant music and, uh, and everything else. And I'm not trying to be negative or run down other churches here unnecessarily. But if we have lost sight of who God is, how he has revealed himself in his word, and how he directs and calls his church to work and to minister and to act, then we have a real problem on our hands. His Christ indeed has become too common. And a common Christ, a common Jesus Christ who sort of just looks like everything else that's in the world will never bring peace, which is the very thing that we need most. St. Augustine worried about this and wrote about this a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. 
He, he, he worried. He wrestled with that. That, that we have lost sight of Jesus. And, and this is one of the things that, that, that Augustine did so well. You know, he has that famous line, that famous saying that's probably his best known at the very beginning of his book, The Confessions. If you don't have Augustine's Confessions, it, it's still not too late. Amazon can probably get it to you by Christmas time. Ask for it. It's, it's worth reading. But he begins in the very opening of book one of the confessions you have made us for yourself O Lord and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you that's the well known one right at the very end of the confessions though Augustine offers this little prayer he says O Lord grant your peace to us for you have supplied us with all things the peace of rest the peace of the Sabbath which has no evening through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen. You see, Augustine understood well what the angel was declaring to each one of us. That there is peace, and peace can only be found through knowing Jesus Christ as he truly is, as he is presented to us in his word. And that the good news of the gospel that he offers to you and to anyone that will believe is that you don't have to perform in order to have the saving faith in Jesus. You can stop trying to perform and you can rest as he, as Augustine describes it, as Sabbath rest. You can rest in the work of Jesus Christ. And him alone. So what do we do with this glory then? What do we do with this peace that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, you'll notice what this angel does with it. He proclaims it. They proclaim it. They put it into song and they sing it. What does that mean for us as a church? Well, I think, for one thing, it means that the gospel needs to be central in our lives and especially in our speech. Now, some people have heard that before, and I think they think it means that we only ever must be talking about the gospel every single instance that we get, but I don't think that's what it means. The gospel, yes, must be central to our speech, but it doesn't have to be exclusive. I mean, think about it for just a moment. If, if your coworker only ever talks about his dog every, seconds, every waking moment that you have with him, I'm not going to turn you off a little bit. And so don't mishear me here, yes. Know the gospel. Be able to present the gospel clearly, meticulously, concisely. Dare I even say quickly? But that doesn't have to be everything. In fact, I think uh, part of our evangelism is knowing how to talk uh, intelligently about other subjects, to draw people closer to yourself, to make them happy when you come around, or at least not unhappy. We proclaim the gospel in our speech. But more than just that, we believe this gospel, this good news that Jesus Christ has dealt with your sins once and for all, and that you can rest in his work and not your own, that that needs to flow out from us as well, that needs to impact every area of our lives. It needs to give us peace. There's uh, something that and I just want to close with this. There, there's, there's something that, that Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, B.B. Warfield, wrote. I'm, I'm sure I've quoted this before. I'm taking a week off here in two weeks, because, in part because I think I'm 
starting to repeat a lot of my sermon illustrations, and so I'm going in search of new ones. But um, bear with me on this one. Uh, Mimi Warfield wrote uh, a, a short article many years ago called The Indelible Mark of the Shorter Catechism. And right at the very end, he gives this uh, story that I love, and I'm not even sure I can get through without getting a little misty-eyed, um, but we'll try. Uh, he says, we have the following bit of personal experience from a general officer in the United States Army. He was in a great western city at a time of intense excitement and violent rioting. The streets were overrun daily by a dangerous crowd. One day, he observed approaching him a man of singularly combined calmness and firmness of mind, whose very demeanor inspired confidence. So impressed was this army officer uh, with this man's bearing amid the surrounding uproar that when he had passed, he turned to look back at him only to find the stranger had done the same. On observing his turning, the stranger at once came back to him and touching his finger with his, his chest with his forefinger demanded without preface, what is the chief end of man? On receiving the countersign, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Ah, oh, said he, I knew you were a shorter catechism boy by your looks. <laughs> Why, that was just what I was thinking of you was the rejoinder. It's a worthwhile pursuit. He goes on to say, it's a worthwhile pursuit to be shorter catechism, boys and girls. They grow up to be men and women. And better than that, they are exceedingly apt to grow to be men and women of God. And we can't afford to miss the chance of training them. How do we please God then? How do we extend his glory into the earth in which we live? How can we be at peace as these men were in the midst of unthinkable change that is going on in our world today? to be concerned of it, but not overcome and overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. We do what the Catechism does, which is what the Bible does, which is pointing us back again and again and again and reminding us of this great salvation that we have only through what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ, that Jesus came and took on flesh so that he might fulfill God's law perfectly in his body and in this life, that he might give up that life on the cross and experience death because of our sin, taking it all upon himself, so that we might rest and be at peace in this world knowing that he has taken care of all of it. And again and again and again, reminding <clears throat> ourselves, preaching that to ourselves on a daily basis, proclaiming that to others, sharing that with them as opportunities present, so that the gospel might go out and the glory of God would continue to go out from our midst, shaping us, molding us, making us more and more like Jesus Christ, so that we, with this angelic host, might be able to proclaim this Christmas season and the rest of our lives, glory to God in the highest for what he has done through Jesus Christ, the peace that we have received, and that we might know that we are pleasing in his sight, living according to this faith, that he has given us. Let's pray together. Father, help us to do this now.
bring more and more glory to you in all our lives and all our thoughts and all our words and actions. Help us to be at peace knowing that you have done everything for us, for our salvation. May that be our identity, our, our very life, that we might please you in all of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 224. If you'll uh, stand with me if you're able. Hymn number 224, go tell us.